Spotlight, Spotlight with Jerome. Sit down. The show's starting. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Spotlight with Jerome. Today, I have the great pleasure to chat with the brilliant Krista Hazel. Krista is a lady of multiple talents. She's an education consultant in teaching and learning languages, well-being, pastoral, speaker, writer, GCSE examiner, language festival coordinator, host of the Linguascope MFL webinars and Association for Language Learning Development Manager. She's also one of the kindest person I have ever met, which is true. So Krista, welcome to Spotlight. Well, thank you. Thank you for that lovely welcome. It's always quite embarrassing when people start talking about you, but that was lovely. Thank okay. you so much. It's really kind. Uh, well, um, it started when I was 11 years old and um, I remember um, my I come from a multicultural family anyway, and my um, my grandmother is is Chinese, so, so there was always this interest and intrigue in 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 language. Um, but but she never taught us, we never learned it. It was quite sad, really. And then, um, but times were different. Um, and then I went to second, well, I went to primary school, went to um, middle school, and suddenly we were doing this language French, and I just inside of me something just hit me that kind of went. You know, if I learn this language, I can travel the world and and move beyond Leeds, travel the world and speak to different people, which to me just was mind blowing. So it was that moment that day I ran home. I remember taking my skirt, rolling my skirt up to run all the way home to tell my mom and dad I was going to be a languages teacher. So right from that point, then is probably the point that started. So That's absolutely always wanted to become a teacher I think that's I I thought I want to be like this person who's teaching me I want to be like them and um, I had some amazing amazing languages teachers and I and I actually really struggled with my A level but but the lovely teacher who I had at, at, at the time was like Krista you'll be fine you'll be fine and I just thought I want to do this so I applied um, actually, I did. I did do a year at, um, an, in a BSc in computer science and French, and just didn't love it because I thought if I at the time it was a case of well, I'll do a, a B Ed, a Bachelor of Education. I'd like to focus on secondary, but then is that just going to make me be a, a, allow me to be a teacher? You know, should I look to see? You know, what happens if I don't like it? What happens if I'm no good at it? What happens if the kids hate me? All of those things. Um, but then I realised after a year that it well in fact I think it was before that that the maths and programming I could do it but I'd always have infinite loops and I was like I am not enjoying this but I loved the French but there was so little of it and I just thought what am I doing so I took a year out after my A-levels I started this BS and um, BSc in computer science and French and actually went back to Manchester what was then Poly uh, now Metropolitan University to do the degree that I would have started at 18 years old if I'd have not had the year out so it, life is a wonderful thing that it brings you around to the right point and and for me I was so excited because they um they offered me I said oh you know when will you hear I'm one of the first in my family to go to university so um they said uh, I said to them when am I going to hear about this and they said oh well you're definitely in but we'd like you to maybe consider doing PE um, and and French and I said uh, a PE because my idea was second um, a B Ed in secondary education French and special educational needs and they were like no we'd really like to do PE first we think you'd be really good and I I'd done quite a lot of sport I was quite a sporty uh, person growing up and then they I just was like no French French is the thing I want to do more than anything so if there's no French on the table as much as I want to come here I I don't want to do it and I remember being terrified and came back out of that interview thinking have I just talked myself out of this place at university because I've been so demanding that I wanted to do French because I wanted to be a teacher and it was amazing I loved it well, um, I went to the Vosges um, and it was so beautiful, a tiny little town called Remiremont, which is just so beautiful and so seemingly in the middle of nowhere, um, but it's just just joyous and and I was actually in two schools I was in um the secondary school in the town in the center and then one right up in the mountains and it was quite a trek quite a trek 
Um, but the schools worked together beautifully. So um, three days I worked, I don't know, well, four days I worked, I think, or across the four days. So I'd always have a long weekend off so I could go off traveling to places. Because, of course, if you're in the Vosges, you could go to Nancy, Strasbourg, um, you know, over to Germany, Switzerland, etc. So it was amazing. I loved the schools. They were both very different. One was very multicultural and very vibrant. The other one was very traditional and very, very different. But I loved it. The teachers were kind, the generosity of people. It was just amazing. And I think the highlight for me, I don't know if I should confess this um, now living in Bristol and being online, but um, Wallace and Gromit was 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 very was quite new, and um, Nick Park obviously Ardman Animations etc. And I remember um, asking my now who is my now husband to send me you know to get me the video as soon as they come on video to get me them so I could take you know he could post them out to me in France, and just using these real films with the kids was amazing. Um, and it was so much fun, but their parents would stop me in the street um, and say, like, ah, well, I think oh, me, we, we need to see this. And I was like, no, no. <laughs> like, I don't think I can, like, what on earth have I done? And thankfully, the local cinema actually got, I think, the, it must have been the wrong trousers. I think it must have been the second one. And, and, and actually got that in their local cinema because the kids, obviously, from this English assistance had I have to say it was a really tricky decision having doing like a five year B ed one year of, year of which was in France and then and then coming back uh, then working 20 years in school across three secondary schools um, actually across the southwest and it was they were amazing I've had so much fun and so much learning out of it but um, it, there came a time when you, I was being offered um, independent thinking had asked me to be their MFL kind of person um, specialist if you like um, they say we all have superpowers and they said that MFL was my superpower and language is my superpower um, so um, so I said okay I'd, I'd love to but I was getting increasingly more opportunities to do things which was drawing me out the classroom and I think I had to make a decision and it was not an easy decision I think I regretted it crying driving home but equally I did it and the reason for that is because we were working with teachers going to teach meets you know when student teachers come into schools uh, and and you really work with them to develop them um, there were groups of us within the in, within secondary schools that I'd worked with who were sort of we weren't called teaching and learning kind of you know geeks or anything like that but that's what we were we were interested in reading finding out new things bringing um, changing our practice developing our practice and so it was that working with teachers that really was the draw from the classroom um so i decided 20 years would be a really good time to do it that's that's two decades done i loved it i don't know if i'm finished in the classroom um and i say that because every time I do actually go and work in a school it's amazing to not only work with teachers and to be a teacher of teachers is just such a privilege such a privilege um but then to work with students as well and recently one of the schools I was working with and um, um, an international school I worked with EYFS teachers and TAs and the children not all at the same time right the way through to IB students so that and an SLT so it's amazing it's I think it's the opportunity that I can if people want me to work with them um, and and they um, and, and they ask me and I've got the time in my diary, then, of course, I will. I would love to work with them if our values align. Um, but the thought of having a bigger impact rather than just in a small in one school, having that bigger impact is phenomenal and just waking people up to. The thing that they can be great because some people, teachers, were very good at saying, oh, you know, not very good. Oh, I don't really feel so we read books. And then we kind of think, oh, but, you know, Steve's book, for example, on, on how to be an outstanding teacher, you kind of like, oh, am I really an outstanding teacher? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. And we always kind of, you know, don't say that about ourselves. It's that imposter syndrome, whereas actually the ability that that our privilege that I have really is to just be able to show present teachers things show you know hold a mirror up to them but encourage them to step out of their comfort them so they can unlock their potential so that for me was the main driver for leaving the classroom because I just thought it is such a privilege to be able to do that and for every single student teacher that I've had worked with every single colleague from different departments whether I was um lead practitioner head of year head of languages um, or whilst I was assistant head it was one of those things that 
actually that's amazing empowering people to step up and you stepping back to give them the opportunity to really really shine and I think that is such a privilege because you see progress development their confidence boost and if in if anything that as teachers we don't want everyone to be the same we want them to find their superpower to unlock their potential so they can be happy healthy engaging teachers that aren't working all hours but equally are in, um, engaged in uh, you know wider reading research action research you know the MFL community or the global teaching and learning community because there's lots of different things out there and it's great <laughs> brilliant um Stefan at Linguscope asked me to be in that role um I said to him you know do I am I able to choose because I was sort of I mean I'm thinking am I able to choose the people because I think it's a real opportunity for me to shine a light on what I think is really incredible practice, really brilliant ideas, concepts, teaching, learning, you know, pedagogy um, that maybe are from people who are lesser known and whether whether you've got 200 followers or 20,000 followers on or across social media channels, it's just the opportunity if someone gives you a chance and, you know, people when I was, I moved into pastoral leadership after my first year of teaching, which is a bit crazy, but I loved it, um, but somebody believed in me and gave me an opportunity and it's about that thing of paying it forward now, I think, and there are incredible people out there um, who don't have a big stage and I think for me if I can just shine a spotlight and people can see their work, whether it's here or overseas, then it would be my pleasure and privilege to do so and I and I keep learning and I keep in touch with what's going on in the classroom so really it's it's just a pleasure for me. You're like a fairy godmother. <laughs> yeah. it is isn't it i think number one yes i am playing another season in september oh that's the answer to question number two definitely and i've already kind of started work on reaching out to people um i look i i engage more with twitter and um um instagram i i um uh, so when i see things when i hear things when i read things if i'm reading a book or something like that i think you know what i really like that or someone's written something or i've listened to or heard something in a podcast someone said oh christy you really like this check this out i do check it out and then i kind of think you know what i would love that person to come and share what they do because i really like it i think it has real value i think it has real potential and rather than that wonderful individual just continue to do it in their classroom in their school perhaps across their department to give them an opportunity to just share their practice online and whether there's you know um 25 people or there's 250 people there you know people watch these afterwards because they're recorded and it is just such a privilege to be able to look around I'm very aware that we need to have a range of languages we need to have a range of different speakers from all kinds of schools because variety is everything and just because you know um i've always taught in 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 state school um mainstream education but you know there are people doing incredible work in special schools and you know in grammar schools and private schools and we need to kind of look and we're all teachers who love languages who want to motivate children who ultimately want them to understand that that, that languages are a force for good and a superpower to have um and you know it's a skill for life therefore if we can if i can help someone like me um who can't necessarily trek to teach meets and things like that and obviously in the last few years we've certainly not been able to and people with families can't necessarily the ability to be able to do that online is just an absolute privilege so yeah and, it, and a couple of people have reached out to me as well to say they'd really like to do it and, and i'm like well let's have a conversation and then yeah absolutely if i think yeah then and if i can help people to um with their content then you know they can just use me as a sounding board before we go live that's fine it's my pleasure to do so and it was it was very much um an opportunity that 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 came around and um the school i was working in at the time had a two-week october half term so i so i because i was thinking there's no way they're going to let me have time off school to 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 go and do this maybe because you know you get paid to do a job ultimately don't you um and um but one of the um, associate directors, Nina Jackson, um, she's at Music Mind on Twitter, went out to Ghana um, about th three, four years earlier and had the most incredible experience and independent thinking still linked um, 
with um, the schools, SOS Village Schools, um, and certainly some of the head teachers, obviously teachers move on and things, but, but they still continue to do that. Um, and they asked us as, as associates, you know, do you want to go? And Lisa Jane Ashes, who's an English specialist, author of Manglish, uh, a mixture of English and maths, um, book which is incredible actually really interesting read um I went with her and we were out there for you know um two weeks so I finished school on the Friday um mm -hmm. went, went to Heathrow Airport got on a plane early hours of Saturday morning came back I think it was the Saturday before before and after two incredible weeks of trekking to lots of different places we started in Accra and went to various different cities um to work with I say SOS village schools our link was um, the SOS village schools education team um, because we wanted to go out there to provide free training free resources which were um, not something you know just just taking something that would be there something that we could train them to do so we held their hand across that two-week period and delivered training that they could then do and then we asked them to come up and plan and present lessons in in the style of which we um, we had taught them using those pedagogies. So whether it was using, because um, obviously resources um, in many, many schools in um, Ghana, they have private schools, paid for schools, there's some hugely rich areas, but also there's some very impoverished areas. And, and that's where we were. And the SOS village schools, um, children actually that attend those schools our orphans are essentially their parents have passed away or the parents have, have had to give their children up for because they can't continue to feed them so it's very challenging circumstances so we were coming in and kind of going to you know what we want to help these teachers um bring what we can share what we can to allow them to continue to um educate inspire um include all of the children that they have within that site, that SOS village site, uh, whether it's in Accra or whether it's in one of the other cities. Um, and just, just to really, you know, um, give something to them that we could, uh, and we're still in touch with some of them now, actually. So that's, that's really nice. Just because we want to, and encouraging them as well to use the harness of well, to harness the power of mobile technology, mobile phones, and you know as well as I do, Jérôme, I am not a tech expert, not by any means. But if there's one mobile phone in the classroom, then a teacher can use it to show children. And actually, when you look at our classrooms here, here in the United Kingdom, and actually, you know, anywhere in a sort of more econ economically developed country, you know, you have more than donated um, pews, chairs, um, that, you know, there are often very few pens, writing materials, um, paper, exercise books, the very small books that they had last probably about four or five years because very little is written down because they just can't afford it. Um, there's no decor on walls often um, and it is literally um, plasters peeling off the wall. There's a very, very old chalkboard right at the front. But then obviously in some other schools, there's something very different, but those were the teachers we were working with and they were very, very wonderful, inspiring people who taught, I think myself and Lisa quite a lot as well. It's unbelievable to think that, you know, we take all these things for granted and having, you know, stationery and having posters yeah. on the wall and having yeah. stuff like that. And it's massive eye opener. It must have been quite a bit of a shock when you arrive on your Saturday morning, uh, and back to the school on the Monday and just said, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, interestingly, um, um, a few people did say it would be a bit of a shock. So what I did with some of my students, I had a tutor group at the time and and uh, um, and, uh, and some some of the children knew that I were going because I think you can't help but share kind of, you know, they ask you what you're doing over half term. It, you know, are you going on holiday, Miss, or are you doing this? And it was like, no, I'm not actually, I'm, I'm going here. So it's not quite a holiday, but maybe, you know, it could be. Um, so they were like, oh, well, what's Ghana going to be like for these children then? So I did my, I, I obviously knew about it, did my research, but I conducted a few lessons with students where I, where I said, right, okay, sit down, come in, welcome. Okay, we're going to teach, like, uh, I'm going to perform a lesson that I'm actually going to perform with teachers over in Ghana. So if you can put all your books, pens, everything away. So I said, oh, right, because, and, and in, um, in my classroom, we were allowed to have mobile phones. So I said, uh, I said, mobile phones away need to go so just outside of my class and there's a big um 
like square area um, for wet break and things like that. So students could um, move tables out there. So we move tables out there. And I said, oh, well, actually, some of you probably won't have chairs either. So you're going to have to sit on the floor. And they were like, <gasps> OK. And I said, well, this these doors, I need to prop this open. These windows, we need to get rid of these curtains. And I completely stripped my classroom down in front of them. They were like, what? is happening like what is she unraveling I think probably they thought but actually I, I then did a, a lesson a phonics lesson actually a sound spelling one and then tongue twisters and using like music and sort of just doing that because I thought well you've always got your body haven't you and that's something that Nina reminded me of you've always got yourself so actually you've got rhythm you've got your hands your fingers you can make sounds you can tap you can sing you can chant and actually you don't need textbooks, the knowledge you have, you can share with children if you do it in, in an appropriate way and you know those children. And obviously the classes here in the UK, I knew, I knew those kids, I knew that they would be kind of shocked. And some of them were like, what, why are we doing this? How aren't, aren't we using the interactive whiteboard, miss? You know, aren't we using this? Aren't we using devices? And I was like, not today, because remember the children in Ghana who I'm going to see, won't have this they won't have interactive whiteboards they won't have whiteboard pens they won't have mini whiteboards etc etc et and these kids were like <gasps> and it really made them think so they knew that we were taking out stationary items and things like that for the schools but also things like skipping ropes and yo-yos and balls for um you know for sports-based activities and so they then started bringing in contributions which was so sweet and so That's incredible lovely. But yeah, it was really lovely, really, really lovely, really um, something that I'll never, ever forget. And it really made me think when I got home, when I came in and put on the kettle and made myself a cup of tea, you know, with milk from the fridge, I just thought, wow, you know, this privilege and those children, you know, they they had a lot they didn't have a lot but they did they had love and they had people adults around them who cared for them and who loved them and it may not have been their parents but they had and um, what they call aunties and they had you know the lead carer as well so they were they were very very fortunate and, and it was a privilege to be able to work with the teachers who help those children to inspire them to be the best that they can be and they really do have vision you know they all want to come they all want to head off to UK or US European universities so they can learn medicine so they can learn um, pharmacy they can learn languages and then come back to Ghana and share that knowledge with their community which is incredible really so. Uh, yes, I think, yeah, I, th I think I would love to, um, I would love to write another book. Um, I think um, it, it was really interesting because obviously being asked to write a book was a real honour. I was like, really, me write a book? But I'm Krista, you know, from Leeds and what have I got to share? Um, but yeah, it was, um, it, it was amazing. Um, it was challenging at times, not going to lie, but it was, um, but, but I loved it and it's been very well received and I am truly honoured and thank you to anybody that listens or watches this and, and has bought it because I, I wasn't sure anybody would. Um, but you know, um, people have done and people have said nice things about it and obviously it's been recognised nationally. Um, there's been um, a chapter um, in a book here and there um, that's been done that I think is going to go to publication later this year, um, but also but that's a joint chapter and then um, looking at grammar, uh, very specifically grammar um, and, and how to um, make that more interesting and relevant and engaging for students I think um, and then maybe maybe if I get some time maybe I'll write another book I certainly would like to but I don't know I don't know yeah I, I've been offered the opportunity so I think I should just say yes shouldn't I yeah well um, mother tongue other tongue obviously is a is a celebration of um mother tongues and other tongues so basically what what we did at the festival of languages we wanted children to be creative and perhaps write something original or if not write something like a nursery rhyme or a poem or a short story or a memory of something from their childhood in their either their mother tongue or indeed their other tongue and it was entirely up to them and then obviously in in producing that and creating that then they um then they um 
decorated these and we had lots and lots of different entries across the northeast which is a project you know the team I was working with there's lots and lots of diverse languages a vast amount and and so there is such diverse communities that we wanted to reach out to those which is why we wanted to do mother tongue other tongue and the work of international newcastle is truly international in respect that they embrace all languages all cultures and just want to celebrate and build tolerance for all of them because they believe that languages is something to be cherished something to be loved something to learn something to respect um and and they've been doing this for a long period of time so the festival which which commenced last year is part of a culmination of many years worth of work and lots of brilliant heads um from a newcastle university durham university um all northeast lots and lots of different brilliant people who have come together and go why don't we just do a festival of languages wouldn't this be great and i believe there has been historically festival of languages in in the northeast um so it's obviously an area that's rich and very vibrant in terms of language and sporting and celebrating languages culture pedagogy creativity and that's what we wanted to do and that's certainly what declan and that team wanted to do so it was my privilege to be able to do that so we had lots and lots of different entries from children and their parents who had written a short um, rhyme, nursery rhyme, and I collated all of these in um, in an in, in an ebook. They are so beautiful, so lovely. Um, and and what we asked them for was um, to write that for us. And it didn't have to be perfect. You know, there could be errors, but language learning doesn't have to be about perfection. You know, we want communication. Um, and then obviously to write the reason why it's so important to them, whether it's um, a song. And there were some um, young people this year who wrote, um, in, they've been really inspired to learn Korean because of um, BTS not because of the Netflix series, the very, you know, the very inappropriate Indeed. for young people Indeed. want, you know, I really like this song because, you know, it really makes me feel happy about this. And I've been feeling a bit down because of the pandemic and it's just been really, really lovely. So I'll definitely send you the link so you can have a look, anybody, anybody can have a look at that. If they want. The Association for Language Learning, um, way back when I was at university, um, Manchester Poly, as it was then, our lecturer told us to become a member of our subject association. So it's something that I felt very passionate about. And we, um, so I became a member, a student member, and then obviously I've just been a member ever since. So the Association for Language Learning is an association um, which has now moved on to be a charity, um, which supports all language teachers. And um, I guess, some might say traditionally it's been French, German and Spanish. That's what I always thought. But now when you look at it, it supports home heritage languages. There's all, um, when I was at university, I used to get a Russian and um, journal because I signed up to it because um, I was teaching myself Russian at the time. I was learning Russian. So I hope one day I'll be able to read these um, pieces. But obviously not all of them were in Russian. Um, there's obviously the Italian zone, too. So that is developed and diversified but the association is there to support language teachers um, here in the UK not exclusively in England obviously in um, and in Scotland there is silt and also there is um, salt which is interesting because silt and salt are quite similar but yeah silt and salt up there but obviously we can support uh, members up there and we do have members up in Scotland and over across in Wales too and just bring together the community through branches hubs and networks really to support one another whether it's putting on events CPD obviously we have um, the um, thrice yearly magazine um, languages today which goes out to all members and we have the online language learning journal too so what and there's a whole team of people um, who are volunteers um, across the UK and beyond, I think, who do incredible work. There's, um, there's the trustees um, the, um, the, and the chair of trustees, who's Professor Renee Kogelbauer Franklin from Newcastle University, who's currently works at Newcastle University, but also is our chair. Um, and then there's people like Annalise Gordon, Helen Myers, Stephen Forks. Dr. Judith Reifieser, Susie Buell, um, various people. Um, oh, obviously our current president, I should say, um, Professor Kim Bauer, and also our incoming president as well, um, who is Liz Black. And um, Jane Harvey has also joined the trustees. So they work together as a management board and they support ALL Council and work with ALL Council too. And I work with them and to support them and liaise with them. But yes, when there are events that local branches, hubs and network have, Stephen 
Stephen Fawkes is instrumental with the membership, honorary membership team, which comprises of him, Susie and Judith. Um, and basically they work to um, raise um, awareness of the association by promoting membership and also supporting hubs, branches and networks. And despite the pandemic, um, we've got two new primary hubs, which is amazing, that's come out of that because people have connected with the association um, and also or been a volunteer, been part of it, but wanted to set up their own in their community, which is great. And also um, two new branches as well. So one in the West Midlands, uh, which Paula uh, Morel is, is, I think, in charge of, is chair of, and um, the other one is the Isle of Wight and South Coast. So, yeah, so it's it's an association that just wants to support teachers. And obviously, during the last two years, if it hadn't been for Helen Myers and her skills and Joe Dale, um, I think a lot of us, including myself, would be significantly less um, skilled than what we are now because thanks to them, not just to them, so, you know, there's people like yourself, Jerome, and various other people um, as well who, who have been sharing their skills online, but they realised what was happening when schools shut down in that March time and said, right, okay, you've got to teach online, let's help upskill you, and then created lots of free weekly webinars, really, just to just um, upskill, um, not just members, actually, they opened it out um, to anybody and everybody that, that wanted to come along to discuss, to, to learn and to be and feel more comfortable teaching online, because some of us were very au fait with it, and some of us really weren't. Well, um, funnily enough, I love live music. And uh, last night I went to my first um, concert post COVID, I think if we're allowed to say that, and I went to go see um, Noel Gallagher and the High Flying Bird. So I love music. I have a vast and very varied music collection, um, which I'm sure drives my husband insane because I've got hundreds and hundreds of CDs, but I love music. Um, and um, also reading. I love film too. So yeah, if I'm not doing those things, traveling is always, has always been a passion and a joy. Um, but to do that as a job is just amazing. So to relax, it's definitely the music, film and reading. <laughs>